Hello, my name is Lori Cohen Hackett and I am president of the St. John Jewish Historical Museum. We are gathered here today via Zoom to commemorate Yom HaShoah, also known as Holocaust Remembrance Day. This day is a memorial to 6 million Jews who were slaughtered by the Nazis between 1933 and 1944. We also honor Jews who fought against their Nazi oppressors, and we honor Gentiles who selflessly aided Jews in need. It is observed on the 27th day of the month of Nisan. This day was chosen by the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. It marks the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a violent revolt that occurred from April 19 to May 16, 1943 during World War II. Residents of the Jewish ghetto in Nazi-occupied Warsaw, Poland, staged the armed revolt to prevent deportations to Nazi-run extermination camps. The Warsaw Uprising inspired other revolts in extermination camps and ghettos throughout German-occupied Eastern Europe. The overwhelming theme that runs through all observances on this day is the importance of remembering and ensuring that such a tragedy never happens again. Please join us as we continue with the rest of our program. Shalom. On Yom HaShoah, we honor the memory of the six million innocent Jewish men, women, and children who were murdered by the Nazis during the Second World War. We also recognize the bravery of the survivors and of those who risk their lives to save others. There are stark contrasts in this memorial as we consider profound loss and suffering along with the courage and survival that has brought us to this day. It has been a very difficult year with the minimization of the Holocaust by labor leaders in our own province and attacks against democracy both inside and outside of Canada. Those who practice aggression to achieve their aims at the expense of others demonstrate their weakness and not their strength and ultimately will be destroyed by their own fear and anger. Please join us in standing with Jewish communities in Canada and around the world in recognizing the sacredness of this day and our hope for a more humane future. Thank you. We're here today to commemorate Yom HaShoah, remembering the darkest years in Jewish history. Six million lost their lives. The war against the Jews tried to erase us from the world. Only now, after over 75 years since the war ended, have the number of the world's Jews returned to the 15 million it was in 1939 when the war began. Our ge geographic distribution has changed enormously. Before the war, two thirds of all Jews lived in Europe. Today, only one tenth still do. Most Jews live in either Israel or in North America. It's hard to think about such large numbers. They become abstract, even though we declare that each one of the victims has a name and personality, we're unable to fight to uh, light six million memorial candles. So we light six, each representing one million of our people. Hardly satisfying, but as humans, that is all we were able to do. The damage from the Holocaust was enormous. It took a multitude of lives, but also destroyed a way of life and a rich Jewish culture in Eastern Europe. The trauma passed down from one generation to the next has also had its effects, even embedding changes in the DNA of the generations that followed after its immediate victims. Thankfully, there seems to be a resurgence of Yiddish lately and klezmer festivals and traditional Jewish cultural relics have become popular in some countries. Suddenly, Jewishness in the absence of Jews is in fashion. The Nazis had already been persecuting the Jews in Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia before the war. Jews who didn't run were soon sent to ghettos. The persecution of the Jews became a genocide with many collaborators. 
a few brave ones hid Jews or their children or spirit them away to neutral countries. Jews were herded, transported, and slaughtered. Death camps opened and the industry of death became operational. Most of the ghettos, slave labor camps, concentration camps, and extermination or murder camps were built by the Germans in Poland. Auschwitz was the largest, most industrial, most efficient, and most infamous of these camps. But there were 42,000 camps of various sorts. Jews were the main target, but other Jews were also victims. Gypsies, supposedly racially inferior groups, homosexuals, so-called defectives, prisoners of war, and political prisoners were among those murdered. Killings were also done by mobile killing squads. Among the most well-known of these mass killings took place at Babi Yar in Ukraine. This is a very large story to tell in the little time that we have, but the story is made up of many smaller stories, stories of individuals, each with his or her own name, and among those stories are the ones of my parents. Among the very many victims of the Nazis were my grandparents, my uncles, aunts, and cousins, and many of the friends and acquaintances my parents had when they were growing up. When the Germans invaded, my parents were ordinary people living in two different small towns. They were young, my mother only 15 years old, and an orphan cared for by her older sister, Hialeah, and her brother-in-law, Moshe, who had their own two young children. My father was 20. My mother's and father's towns each had about 5,000 residents, of which about half or more were Jewish. German troops entered my mother's town after Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. It was the turn of the century of the Jewish calendar, the year 5,700. In a small taste of what was to come, Cook pots were overturned, food thrown into the street, men and children humiliated and beaten, and worse. My mother and her sister's family were forced eastwards to the Soviet zone of Poland. At his town, my father Frank was rounded up for interrogation. Jews were dragged into, the, uh, into a tent and beaten for their supposed hidden treasure. My father slipped out of the line placed a hand over one eye and pretended to limp. When a German soldier challenged him, asking him if he had been beaten, he replied, ja, mein Herr, and then limped away as quickly as he could. He was a clever man. My father saw that things would get worse. He decided to escape with a few friends east behind the Russian lines. He tried to convince his family and girlfriend of the time to leave with him, but they wouldn't go. So my father left and soon crossed the border into Russia. Most couldn't imagine what was to come. They stayed behind, trusting and hoping. My father returned to his town, trying one last time to convince his family and girlfriend to leave, but they still wouldn't go. They all died in Treblinka. In Russia, my father tried to join the, the Russian army to fight the Germans but as a Polish citizen, he was considered a security risk and was turned down. Instead, he drove an army truck, later worked as a guard at a coal mine in the Caucasus, and after that as a tailor, sewing Russian army uniforms. My Esther, my mother, was 15 years old, as I said, when the war arrived at her door. She and her sister's family were pushed towards the Polish uh, city of Bialystok on the other side of the new border, between the extended German Reich and the enlarged Soviet Union, then deeper into the Soviet Union. Life was very hard during the, the war. Every human need was rationed. At one point, despairing over these hardships and her children's hunger, my aunt wanted to return to Poland, unaware of what was happening for the, to the Jews there. I don't know why, but they stayed. And so they survived. Some Jews who had fled Poland during the early days after the invasion returned to Poland, not realizing that this road led to the death camps. A remnant of Poland's Jews survived in Russia. The Nazis invaded Russia in 1941, and it was not until 1945 that the fighting ended. 
My mother was sent to a labor camp in the far north while she, as a punishment while she was in Russia for, for becoming sick. There she worked cutting trees. A number of the few relatives who survived spent time in Uzbekistan, in Siberia, or other parts of the Soviet Union. During all this, my parents met and fell in love. In January 1946, the war finally over and my parents safe. They were married by a rabbi in what was then an illegal religious ceremony. I still have their handwritten ketubah, their Jewish marriage contract. Polish citizenship allowed my parents to leave the Soviet Union when the war was over. My father tried to return to his home in Poland, but it had been taken over by neighbors. He was threatened with death when he tried to enter it. So my parents continued westward. My mother lost one brother and her family to the death camps and another to typhus in Russia during the war. My father lost all of his immediate family. This is why I consider my parents Holocaust survivors, though they themselves weren't in any concentration camp. They survived the Holocaust where their family members didn't. Really, all European Jews who survived the war were Holocaust survivors. Some ask why many stayed. Didn't they know what was happening? Put them yourselves in their shoes. Imagine what you would do. You have a home, small children, and old people to look after. It's very hard to leave your world behind and go off on a road to who knew where, not knowing what comes next. After all, the Germans were known to be a civilized people, weren't they? Their history was filled with art, music, and poetry. Theirs was a culture of liberal, liberal values, of science and philosophy. Could they really do such evil? Surely they would go on. They, life would go on, and this too would pass. As for the other questions, why didn't they fight back? Why did the Jews walk like sheep into the gas chambers? Many did fight. They, they joined the partisans in the forest, fought it to the end of the Warsaw Ghetto and other ghettos, smuggled weapons, and joined the Allied armies. But starved, brutalized, and worked beyond exhaustion, many had no fight left in them. After the war was over, there were millions of refugees. Many were sent back to the countries, their countries by force. Some got rid of documents to avoid being returned. Before they could resettle, refugees were housed in former slave labor camps, concentration camps, and death camps, which had been repurposed as displaced persons or DP camps. They were guarded by allied troops until they could return to their countries of origin or find another country of refuge. There were hundreds of DP camps scattered mostly in Germany, Austria, and other Western European countries. Jews were at first housed together with anti-Semitic Germans and other nationalities, and life in the camps was full of danger for them. Food was scarce, and after a few months, though, changes began to be made, and Jews were separated into their own camps. Something like a quarter million Jews who survived until the war's end were placed in various DP camps from 1945 on. My parents were directed to a DP camp in the town of Paking in the American zone of occupied Germany, where I was born. The last camps were mostly closed by 1953. Paking DP camp closed in 1949, a year after we left for Canada and St. John. Before war, the war, almost every country, including Canada, refused entry to Jews trying to escape from the Nazis. But after the war, things changed somewhat and Jewish war refugees began to leave the camps in Europe. Agents of the, agents of the Jewish agency recruited Jews to emigrate to Palestine. Many uh, braved the embargo by the British who ruled uh, in Palestine with a League of Nations mandate um, and, because, uh, and were determined to keep the Jews out. Some made it through, others didn't, many did not, and they were sent to detention camps in Cyprus. The United Nations ended the British mandate in May, 1948 and divided the territory into two, one Jewish, the other Arab. 
almost two years after I was born, my parents left Pocking for Canada. My mother wanted to go to the newest Jewish state, Israel, to join her older sister and a brother. But my father had already lost too much to the war and knew what the new Jewish land, that the new, new Jewish land, would soon see more of that. He opted for a peaceful life in Canada. Like my parents, many of Europe's Jews who survived the war left. The US, Canada, Australia, and many other countries in the West, as well as Israel became home. Europe now has one and a half million Jews left with a third living in France, but many are leaving that country too now as a result of violent anti-Semitic acts. Many are heading for Quebec. Worryingly, anti-Semitic behavior has lately become more overt in many countries. Sadly, the slogan, never again, has become ever again. Perhaps ironically, Germany and Poland are among the most welcoming in Europe now for Jews. The fastest growing Jewish populations in Europe now live there and thrive there. We came to St. John New Brunswick in July 1948, where we lived on High Street, sharing an apartment with my father's refugee cousins. My brother was born in 1949 at St. John General Hospital. My father worked as a, a tailor in St. John, but in 1951, to find greater opportunity, we moved to Montreal. He worked in what was, that, what was known as a schmata trade the textile trade. As a second generation survivor, I know it's important to remember the past and its lessons, but also to live in the present and build the future. My brother and I studied at McGill University. I became a dentist and he became a pediatrician. He now lives with his family in Toronto or, and the area. I have lived in Montreal ever since I came here at the age of four. My three children were born in Montreal and educated here, and they, are, they all still live here. Just over a month ago, my granddaughter was born here. We're here to stay in this land of peace for that, especially now with the terrible things we see going on in Europe, I'm grateful. My mother, Chaya Langsam Nichinsky, and my father, Lewon Nichinsky, were both Holocaust survivors. They both ended up in the Bergen Belsen concentration camp in northern Germany. Their journeys began in different places. My mother's began in Vilna, Lithuania, when she was born on December 31st, 1930. Her mother and sister shared the journey of loss of freedom forced labor, and concentration camps, and they survived together. Her father was shot by the German SS and their Lithuanian collaborators and fell into one of the many mass graves in the Panari forest, along with almost 100,000 others. Few of the Jews of Vilna survived. My mother was 15 years old when Bergen-Belsen was liberated by the British forces on April 15th. 1945. When I was growing up, my parents spoke little of the Holocaust. My father's story is easier for me to speak of because some of his experiences were documented in an interview with a sixth grader and with university students in Montreal over the years. He left a legacy as an executive member of the Bergen Belsum Association of Montreal and I had also accompanied Dad to the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen in Germany in 1995. My father's life began in Lodz, Poland. 
He was born on May the 4th, 1923. Lewin was the eldest of five children of Itzik and Dora Nitschinski. From March to April, 1940, he and his family resided in the Lodge ghetto. His father, Itzik, was a tailor. He died of pneumonia in 1940. Dad's mother, Dora, his three brothers and one sister died in unknown ways and unknown places during the Holocaust. Leon was taken by the Nazis during a trip he made to fetch fabric for someone. He remembers that day as being May 14th, 1940. He was 17 years old and he never saw his family again. Leon was first taken to the Poznan concentration camp, which was a temporary camp where people stayed until their fate was decided. He related his experience of enforced labor at a factory of some sort from 1940 to 41. He then told of being moved to work in a coal mine in Poland in 1941-42. In 1943, he was moved to Auschwitz until March of 1944. Those that arrived at Auschwitz and were triaged to work rather than to die were tattooed with a serial number on their arm. My father's left arm held the number 143375. Another year of starvation, deprivation and horror he spoke of one move from one camp to another in winter, poorly clothed, starving, walking through the night in freezing temperatures and snow. Stop and you were shot or left along the road to die. In July of 1944, Leon was moved to yet another concentration camp where again he was forced labor. And in November of 1944, he was taken to Bergen-Belsen. My father used to say that he almost died three times. During his transfer by train to Bergen-Belsen, the train stopped and opened several car doors at a time to let people out for a short time. And during the time that he was let out, the train was bombed and many that were locked in the railway cars were killed. Another time he was injured in a work accident and was taken to the camp hospital he refused to stay there and jumped out of a window and went back to work. Dad had a deep mistrust of doctors and hospitals. Later that day, the SS rounded up and executed all the patients at the hospital. In April of 1944, the month of liberation, my dad said he was 90% dead. He was surrounded by people who were dead and dying. They were there were mass graves, pits where corpses were tossed and burned. One day he was so tired and sick, he fell asleep and he didn't feel the rope that was tied to his feet. He was being dragged towards the pit. He had been mistaken for a corpse. He woke up close to the burning hole and shouted that he was not dead. Following the liberation of the concentration camp, those who survived were moved to the nearby community where the German military had lived. This was also Bergen-Belsen. It was referred to as a displaced persons camp. They were DPs. There they received health care and food. Eventually schools were created. There was a police force created to protect the community from outsiders and it was staffed by the Holocaust survivors. Dad was proud to be one of these policemen. As he described it, over time, Bergen-Belsen became a place that transitioned from catastrophe to rebirth. The camp was closed in 1950. Like many others, my parents met and married in Bergen-Belsen. They married in 1949. Dad used to tease that he married my mom because she was one of the few who had a living mother and he needed a mother more than anything. My dad's sister, Ita, and her husband, Jacob, and their son, Henry, moved to Canada. Leon and Chaya, my parents, moved to Canada 
that move to Canada was never in doubt. How Canada was chosen by all of them in the first place was never discussed. In 1949, my parents arrived in Halifax via ship to Pier 21. From there, they boarded a train to Montreal where they joined the Holocaust survivor community and my family, my mother's sister, brother-in-law and their son. My mother was pregnant at the time of the voyage. It was another standing joke in my family that my mother was pregnant, but it was my father who was dreadfully seasick. My father used to say he was born three times. The first time was in 1923 in Lodge, Poland. The second time was on April 15th, 1945, when Bergen-Belsen was liberated by the British forces. And the third time was in December of 1949 when he arrived in Canada. In Montreal, the Bergen-Belsen survivors established a chapter of the Bergen-Belsen Association. One of their proudest accomplishments was publishing a book called Holocaust and Rebirth, Bergen-Belsen in 1965, as well as establishing a memorial which was a replica of the one in Bergen-Belsen. Every year on the first Saturday or the first Sunday after April 15th, the survivors and their families would gather and say Kaddish to remember what happened and those that never survived and to be in each other's company. My father was very proud of having been a member of the executive of that organization and sharing responsibility for those accomplishments. So what and who was this man, Leon, in his new life in Canada? He was a proud man who had an aura of dignity about him, an honest man. He was open and social on the surface. If an elephant was standing on his foot, he would say he was okay. He did not trust others outside his small circle and would hate to show any vulnerability. He loved to drive and he loved to drive cars. He loved his cars. There were many Sunday drives and road trips to the Laurentians and to visit friends in Toronto and New York with two car sick daughters in the back seat. He took his responsibility to provide for his family seriously. And he was proud that his wife never had to work outside of their home. His lifelong distrust and fear of doctors and hospitals was ironic because I worked for decades in the healthcare system, having felt profoundly at home the first time that I walked into the lobby of the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal as a child. My dad never really quite understood that. Dad once chose to die rather than to have mitral valve replacement surgery only when I told him that I respected his decision to die and that I would do my best to take care of my mom did he change his mind and have the surgery. Dad worked as a tailor for three years when he came to Canada and transitioned to the fur business and he eventually started his own small business as a fur finisher. He was an entrepreneur, a hard worker. He needed autonomy and he worked well into his 80s, stopping just a few months before the time of his death. Dad was fiercely independent. He had a quirky sense of humor and he loved to tease people. He would feed my sister's dog under the table when he was not supposed to. He really liked breaking some rules. He enjoyed having fun, going to a party, laughing, tossing back some vodka at a wedding or a bar mitzvah. Dad was a kind man. I once asked my dad why he survived when most didn't. It was luck, he said. Someone had to survive, and he was the lucky one. All in all, he loved life and saw himself as lucky. Amazing. Mm-hmm.
ימים שוכן במרומים המצאם מנוחה נכונה תחת כנפי השפינה בין מעלות קדושים וטהורים כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the souls of our brethren who perished in the Shoah, men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and suffocated and burned to ashes. May their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. And now, let us join in prayer for ourselves and for all whose spirit now finds voice through us, that God and God's sovereignty will forever be hallowed and enhanced, glorified and celebrated. May all of us who mourn and all of us who cherish loving memories on this day open our hearts to God, our ruler and redeemer, our ever-present hope, our eternal source of comfort, as we recite the words of the Kaddish. Yit gadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah be'alma divra kirute v'yamlich machute בחיי חון וביומי חון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן קרי ואמרו אמן. יהא שמי רבה מברך לעלם ולעלמי עלמיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא, 
Vit hadar vit ale vit hala shemed kudisha brihu. Le ela min ko birchata vishirata. Tush bechata venechemata. Da amiran be alma vi imru amen. Yehe shlama raba min shmaya. Vechayim alenu vi alkoil Yisrael vi imru amen. O se shalom bim romav. Hu ya ase shalom aleinu ve al kol Yisrael ve imru amen. To conclude, I would like to share a quote from Eli Wiesel. For the survivor who chooses to testify, it is clear. His duty is to bear witness for the dead and for the living. He has no right to deprive future generations of a past that belongs to our collective memory. To forget would not only be dangerous, but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Thank you for joining us.